On May 13, 2013, Kermit Gosnell, a Pennsylvania abortion doctor, was convicted for murder in the deaths of several children. In that trial, witnesses testified that these babies survived abortions Gosnell was performing, after which he killed them outside the womb. Although the media, in concert with the American abortion lobby, is portraying this as an isolated situation, the pro-life movement has been aware of similar stories for years, and today, additional examples are beginning to emerge. On May 3, 2013, the following interviews were conducted with three recent employees of an abortion clinic located in a different state. Their real names are used in this production, but the identity of the doctor and his facility are being withheld to keep from compromising a criminal investigation into this matter. At the time this video was released, the abortion clinic in question remained open. Warning. This video contains material that is graphic and disturbing, and it is not suited for all audiences. Discretion is strongly advised. I was an OR assistant. I was basically, I did a lot of parts of the clinic, and one of my, um, one of my jobs was um, his right chair assistant. And I really didn't, I never paid attention, I did pay attention, but I didn't know that it was illegal. Um, when he did an abortion, especially a over 20 week abortion, um, most of the time the fetus would come completely out before he either um, cut the spinal cord or he um, introduced one of the instruments into the soft spot of the fetus in order to kill the fetus. And, uh, but I wasn't aware, you know, I thought, well, it's an abortion, you know, that's, that's what he does. But I wasn't aware that it was illegal. And on many occasions we had fetus that he would, um, he would use a part, uh, the process as far as, um, what is it called, where he would dilate the cervix and then evacuate, e dilate the cervix, evacuate the uterus. And um, most of the time um, we would see him where the fetus would come completely out and of course the fetus would still be alive because he was still moving and you could see, of course you could see the stomach breathing and um, that's when he would do his, um, he would snip the spine as they're saying that um, <coughs> this doctor did. And of course the soft spot was one of the spots that he would um, uh, take the, one of the forceps or the, what is it called? Um, the dilators and stick it down the soft spot of the fetus's head. When you saw this happen? Oh yes. Every, I think every morning I saw several, on several occasions. If we had, um, if we had 20 something patients, of course, maybe 10 or 12 or 13 or 15 patients would be large procedures. And out of those large procedures, I'm pretty sure I was seeing at least three to four um, fetus that were completely delivered in some way. Uh, or another, because sometimes laminaria causes the cervix to get so soft that um, you don't need you don't need a lot of a lot of uh, pulling or anything on it. Once you take that package out, nine times out of ten, that fetus is ready, kind of just to flow from inside of the uterus out into you when know. You say package, you mean the laminaria? the laminaria package insertion? Yes, right. sir. You take uh -huh. that out, and, and the baby's ready to come out. Yes, sir. As soon as that, uh, or sometimes he would um, go ahead and. Um, bust the water sack and there you go you know you practically had a fetus you know in the pan so and you would you see the baby alive yes sir and him him to kill that baby outside the womb yes sir and this would be done by jamming some sort of instrument into the either that or or or, soft spot. or, or um twitch actually twisting the head off the neck kind of with his own bare hands and you saw that happen yes sir Sometimes he would go through the stomach as well. Sometimes he would do what? He would like force it through the stomach. The the instrument. Mm -hmm. The for the is it beers? And like twist it. Yeah. And you Another saw that? Mm-hmm. Anything that he could get to the fastest. Like she said, the umbilical he was probably perforating the umbilical cord. Um, I normally saw either the snipping of the spine or the introduction of the instrument in the soft spot of the fetus normally or twisting of the neck I remember he would put like his finger yeah this. or his finger he'd take his finger and then oh, and through the throat. throat yeah you remember mm -hmm. that um the one that he did that the baby that he came the fetus came out and it was alive he had thought he had actually killed it already and he opened up his eyes and grabbed his hand his finger mm -hmm. remember that one no what happened 
supposedly they said that it was a botch and it was a botch abortion the fetus was still alive he thought it was dead mm -hmm. and the fetus opened his eyes and actually grabbed his finger was able to grab his finger and the whole procedure I guess while he's doing the procedure he was getting after the fetus of course he has to massage the abdomen to bring the planceta down or grab it with the forceps to bring it out and this baby was was alive now, huh? he was alive well, yeah, he's looking at him, he grabbing his finger. Yeah. yeah. He thought he had finished with the baby. It was he thought it was deceased. It was a deceased. Already. He was getting ready to put it in the bag. Did he talk about that? One of his employees did. That's how I found out. He, he, he doesn't talk about that. He doesn't make any comments about it. How did he kill that baby, do you know? Yeah. We found out about it through another employee. I, I don't think that was, that was said how he killed it. I'm not sure. It must have been a big abortion, though, I believe. can't really recall, but I, I know that he does a lot of huge abortions. A lot of the times, we would bring the, the big fetus that were over age, and we would oh, reopen the bag and just look at it and be like, oh, my God, it's so big. You know, we would be amazed how big it was, and we'd be sweating and stuff because it'd take us almost like almost an hour to perform an abortion that big. It's really hard when you only get doing an abortion that big and, and only dilating with like maybe 13 to 14 laminaries in the cervix. It's kind of hard. So. Sometimes he couldn't get the fetus out. He would yank pieces, piece by piece, yeah. when they were over the size. And I'm talking about the whole floor dirty. I'm talking about me drenched in blood. We had several occasion, uh, occasions that where women would come in and um, they would actually be going in, in labor um, because um, that overnight insertion, the package, um, he might have gone a little bit too far with putting too many in there and some <coughs> women had um, started um, to cramp and sometimes they would get to the clinic and they would make it to the OR room because they're in a line and you know when they get there they give them these pills called Cytotec and they put them in your, your gums. gums. And it takes, I'm thinking it takes about an hour before you get a full effect, and that makes you, your uterus start contracting. And so a lot of, um, we've seen a lot of cases where women would have to, they felt like they had to push and they had to run to the bathroom and stuff. And on some occasions we had women that were, um, the fetus were falling into the toilet, or they were, um, or before even getting to the clinic, we had one incident where it was big news where the fetus was left in the toilet. I don't know if y'all heard of that one. She was at McDonald's. They stopped there in the morning and the fetus was left in the toilet and nobody ever found out oh, whose, yeah. whose fetus it was, but it was one of his patients. We knew it because we were watching it on the news that day that she was supposed to be in the clinic. Do you remember that one that <clears throat> she was on her way to the OR, Crystal? And she was walking to her OR and she had it right mm -hmm. there in the hallway. She had her baby in the hallway? Yes. And what happened to that baby? I wasn't down there when that happened. Were you down there? Um, he just picked it up with like a pad, one of those um, chucks, a chuck, uh -huh. and just put it in a trash bag. On some occasions, of course, he pulled out a lot of breech fetus, and um, their toes would be moving. You know, you mm -hmm. can see the fetus toes moving, and um, as he would insert the forcep, what are they called? The beards. There's two types. Mm -hmm. There's the beards, and then there's uh, the sofers. The beers are the ones with the bigger claws, um, and that's the one he would use to yank the fetus out. And I remember, I, I, I have a visual all the time, I always remember this, it's real disturbing to me, where he used to clamp, like push it in. He would hold the fetus by the feet and kind of pull down and insert the, the claws. And when he would squeeze them, you can see that, that baby's toes spread open. And I would always say, oh my goodness, you know, and people say that these, that they don't feel. Well, if they didn't feel, why would their toes, you know, well, you know, their toes would be out hanging kind of like in a, what's going on, you know, you know, where, where, where am I going? And I remember, I remember clearly every time he used to use that, that, that instrument, I remember those little toes, you know, opening wide. It was, it was a sad picture. I normally would turn around kind of just hold and, you know, just turn around until he was finished. And um, he would do um, 
abortions way over 24 weeks. I mean, there's a big difference in a 24 week fetus. And every week from 24 on up, that one week is such a big difference. I'm talking about big fetus. I'm talking about being in the OR about an hour trying to do one procedure that big. I'm talking about being really tired after this procedure from where he could not get this fetus out. You know, and it was, it's very overwhelming. Mm -hmm. We used to, we, we used to look at each other and sometimes our tears would come out, you know, with the other assistants. Our tears would come out because it was just, it was, we would say to ourselves, why? He's just, we would always think he's so greedy, you know? And we were not talking about normal price. I'm talking about $4,000, $5,000 for a procedure this big. As long as they, the patients had the cash, he was going to do it past the 25 weeks. Yeah. Did, did you ever assist like... like? Uh, yes, I did. You did? Mm -hmm. What kind of experiences did you have? The same thing she did is the same thing I did. I would tell um, Deb Deborah all the time, Deborah, I don't want to go in there, I don't want to go in there. And he would tell me, like, yeah. you can do it, you can do it. If you feel like you just can't look at it, just turn your face. He wanted me in the phone room because I've always been pretty good at appointments and, you know, talking to people and, and convincing them to come to the clinic. I just knew my way, you know, as far as talking to patients, being real good convincing patients to make appointments. And so that's when he threw her in the back office, which was OR, sterilization, you know, things like that. I mean, there there's a lot of things. I mean, from these large abortions, these botched abort abortions that he was doing, um, to hurting the patients on the table, to causing some kind of um, major problem with the woman's, you know, ripping a uterus and not letting the patients know, trying to stitch them back together and send them home with the package of gauze, and then they come back tomorrow so you could pull it out, but never telling the woman, you know, hey, I ripped your cervix. You need to get some kind of, you know, some kind of special, you know, you need to get that looked at, you know. Um, he never, he would never tell the woman. And if he had a patient that asked a lot of questions, he'll prefer for them to be put to sleep. Yeah. Oh, really? Yes. Right. Any little comment that you would make as far as if he were on the table, it was his way of making more money, of course, because deep sedation meant, it meant dishing out another $200. So if you made, is it going to hurt? I mean, this man would walk out the room and say, Deborah, go talk to her, tell her she needs to get put to sleep. And normally it was our job to go convince the girl that she had to get put to sleep. And a lot of them <clears throat> raised a lot of hell. Right. But they didn't have no choice. They had to do what he said because guess what? You're gonna lose $150. In other words, that was $150 that you did not get back. So a lot of them would either lose the 150 or pay the 200 and go ahead and get it over with. So other <clears throat> employees besides just just uh, Deborah and Crystal knew that this these sort of things were going oh, on. Yeah. yeah. Everybody there. Everybody knows. It was, That's not, it, it's an open book. Yeah. The women that go there have no idea what they're getting themselves into. A lot of the questions have been, Do fe does the baby feel? And I think that that would make me so mad because I would say, why, why would that matter to you if you're coming in here to kill your baby? You know, why ask that question? And of course she would want to say, yeah, it feels, but that wasn't your job to say that. Your job was to whatever it took to get that person in the back, you know.